Hey everybody, tonight we're debating secular humanism versus Christianity, which is better for society, and we are starting right now with Matt's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us, Matt. The, f the floor is all yours. Did you say that twice or was there a hiccup? Thanks so much for having me. Uh, hello to James. Thank you, Randall, for agreeing to do this. Um, I'm Matt Delaney. For those of you who don't know, most of you will know me as an atheist and a skeptic, but I'm also a humanist, and I've pointed out many times that of the three things there that uh, kind of define me and who I am, skepticism is the most important. Everything else is derived from that with regard to epistemology. So my atheism is the result of that. But my humanism isn't necessarily the result of uh, skepticism. I still apply skepticism to various claims. But it struck me when I was finding my way out of Christianity that what I needed was some sort of label for the package of things that I was going to accept and not accept and what my goals were with regard to ethics and morality. And uh, other people had already done uh, much of the heavy lifting for me. And so I've identified as a secular humanist for, I don't know, the past 20 some odd years. And it's today's subject is, is near dear to my heart, but it's also a little bit of a cheat because one of these two ideas secular humanism versus christianity one of them is perhaps more flexible than the other um the limitations that come when you start talking about christianity and what christianity's goals are and um how it interacts with with our culture and who we are is very different from secular humanism even if we both have the same sort of goals in mind um but whether or not we have the same goal in mind is, I guess, the question of this debate. Because when I talk about is secular humanism better for the world than Christianity, I'm talking about for humans in this life. I'm not talking about an afterlife or goals of an afterlife. Uh, it doesn't matter to me whether what's good for humans is good for a god or some alien species or anything else like that. Um, I, what started off as, for me, God versus atheism um, became something more because God isn't a philosophy. It's not a system. It's not a worldview and neither is belief in God. And yet the packages that we get from those beliefs like Christianity, those can be a system or a worldview. Secular humanism has as its primary goal, the flourishment of human beings. Its goals are in the recognition that whether or not there is a God, whether or not there's something supernatural, it's irrelevant to secular humanism because we don't get to appeal to God claims and supernatural claims to fix our problems. Secular humanism begins with the recognition that we all share space here. We are going to have to live here together. The things that I do are going to impact your life. The things that you do are going to impact my life, perhaps not all the time in all ways, but by and large, that's that's the case. And in the recognition of that, knowing that we would like to flourish and that we would like to uh, be uh, live the sort of life um, that we would generally refer to as better. Uh, and I know that right off the bat, we've got lots of potential terms to argue about and define about what's better. Is this better? Is that better? Is this a better world? Is that a better world? I think we can look at it uh, with some fairly simple examples. Um, a, a world that uh, supports and sanctions individual liberty and freedom as opposed to servility, as opposed to slavery, as opposed to making humans second tier to something else, uh, would seem to be, in many ways, better for us. And if we're going to compare betters, we don't get to appeal to the supernatural there either. We don't get to say what's better for us with regard to an afterlife. And so I found myself in a world where no God had been shown to exist, where there isn't agreement on which God exists, where even within Christianity, which was the religion that I was a part of, there are countless denominations from different, um, with different perspectives on each aspect of this. I remember one of my favorite debates of all time um, was a, a debate between two Christian apologists arguing over how, what we must do to be saved, essentially the subject of soteriology. And each one of them showed up with Bible verses to support their view, and each one of them made a completely compelling case from the standpoint of those Bible verses. Neither of them said, <clears throat> you've interpreted this wrong. They just opted for different verses. And so 
if Christianity's ultimate guide is the Bible, and it can lead two devoted Christians to two completely different and mutually exclusive views on the on the nature and and qualifications for salvation, I don't know how it can be viewed as a good guide towards proper Christianity or an afterlife, let alone better for humanity as it is now. There are three versions of the Secular Humanist Manifesto. I prefer, I think, the second one, um, although I don't have it up to look at it. And what's key here is that if you begin with this notion that we're going to find the tools and the positions that allow us to have a more flourishing existence, to have a better existence, then it doesn't matter where you find those, which means if there is anything within Christianity, anything within Islam, anything within Scientology, although I'd be surprised, anything within some other religion or worldview that is undeniably better for human beings, dem- demonstrably an improvement to the world, it is therefore consistent with humanism. And that's why I say in some ways the debate topic is a little bit of a cheat because Humanism isn't a list of do's and don'ts. There are no Ten Commandments. Um, And that's also good in the sense that when we find out that there's a better way, we can then change, and that becomes consistent with humanism, or humanism actually changes to become consistent with the best methods. It's similar to science in that a scientific exploration of the world is an attempt to gain knowledge. And therefore, you're going to use the methods that consistently demonstrate that they're going to produce the best results, the the most accurate model of reality. In the same way, while we don't have a specific set of tools that you can identify, we do have some tools, which is scientific evaluation of data, where religions and Christianity and others may spread through conversion or coercion. Um, The acceptance of secular humanism is done through data and discussion and debate, things like this. If you make a compelling case, my big thing is, why would anyone not be a humanist? Now, I have some friends who aren't humanists anymore, despite the fact that they agree with everything in the Humanist Manifesto. They just don't think it goes far enough. Um, they think it should you know, also be about all sentient animals. And so maybe there's something better coming down the pipe um, for all sentient animals. But as it stands for human beings right now, The ethical values are derived from human need and interest and are tested by expertise. Um, Humans are an integral part of nature, the result of evolutionary change, an unguided process. Um, These are things from the Humanist Manifesto, that knowledge of the world is derived by observation, experimentation, and rational analysis, that life's fulfillment emerges from individual participation in the service of human ideals, that humans are social by nature and find meaning in relationships, and working to benefit society maximizes individual happiness. When you have as your cornerstone human beings and their flourishing, and you compare that to a system that has as its foundation God and what God wants, First of all, you can have no guarantee that Christianity even considers human beings' best interests at all. If if the foundation of the of the of the system is to do what God wants you to do, to live the life that God wants you to live, to be the person, albeit ostensibly better uh, from their perspective, that means that it is entirely God focused. As a matter of fact, when I was a Christian, it would have been absurd and. I would have arrogantly dismissed anything that was human-focused as you have now put humans on a pedestal so that you worship humans and humanity in place of where God is. And that troubled me, especially when I first found my way out. And the answer is that from the standpoint of secular humanism, we're not worshiping humans in place of God. We're just recognizing that we as humans have to figure out how best to make decisions about ethical dilemmas in this world. Our men and women going to be equal? Are people of different races and ethnicities going to be considered equal? Are property rights going to be equal? Do people have sovereignty over their own body? Is the purpose of your daily life something that is decided by you, or is it dictated by a god or by a government or by parents? Um, the, The value of the individual freedom is sort of counterplayed by the recognition that you as an individual also have to share space with other people. And this impact that we have with each other means humanism should look at any given situation and say, 
in my view. Think about what would the world be like if everybody took the action I'm about to take or if everybody was free to take the action. Obviously, if everybody jumped at the same time, that, that might have an impact. It wouldn't, but it, it, something like that could have an impact that, that isn't what I'm portraying. But think globally, act locally. Think about um, what world we want to see. And if it's a world where people are generally happier, generally healthier, um, we're never going to solve every problem. But if the goal of their individual life is determined by their own autonomy uh, with as, min as little, imp uh, little imposition by governments and, and religions as possible, you end up with a world that is better. Now, how would you do better than a world that's focused on human beings? I don't know how you can do that by adding in a focus on a God and adherence to particular scriptures, declarations about you know human uh, who, who you can love, who you can marry, uh, you know all, all the various arguments that we get into. There's no denying that Christianity and religion have impacted the world many times in many ways, in many positive ways. But we have yet to have a secular humanist government. We have yet to put the principles of secular humanism into place in broad strokes. All we have are governments that are increasingly more secular and where people report a greater happiness. It's not the best way to go about figuring out which system is actually best. For me, it's about empathy, education, and effort. And if you contrast that with a God, a God may or may not be real. There's no agreement on God's existence. There's no agreement on what God wants. If if Randall's view of what, what the Christian God wants is different from my view, is different from somebody else's view, we don't have any way to actually solve these issues, which is why there's over a thousand denominations that identify as Christian in some sense, and they disagree on everything. Some of them are in favor of marriage equality. Some of them are in favor of legalizing marijuana. Some of them are opposed to abortion. Some of them aren't. It, the, the inability to say, here's how and why this system is better, is exacerbated within Christendom because it does not have that as the express goal. My understanding, and Randall's take may be different, my understanding from my time as a Christian is that the primary focus is Christ. The primary focus is God. My life is not mine under Christianity. My life is there to serve, to glorify, and to allow the Holy Spirit to move, to lead other people to Christ. While that may be ultimately good for us in a world we can't demonstrate exists and may lead to a better afterlife if in fact an afterlife like that exists it is not better for this world right here right now where 10 or 20 percent of your income is going to a and system that does not demonstrate that it has your best interests at heart whereas humanism does and doesn't ask you for a penny and time. Thank you very much for that opening statement. And want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, I'm your host, James. Want to say we hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you're from, Christian, atheist, Muslim, you name it. We're glad that you're here and have to let you know, if you have had your fingers in your ears and you've been living in a cave on Mars, as you can see at the bottom right of your screen, if you haven't heard yet, our upcoming debate is on Saturday, April 22nd in Fort Worth, Texas. I should say our debate conference. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be huge. The links to the tickets are in the description box, including if you're like, well, James, I don't know. I'm pretty far from Fort Worth, Texas. Don't worry. You can actually watch this one live from at home for only a buck. If you throw a dollar into the crowdfund, that helps us cover the venue costs. The link for that crowdfund is down in the description box as well. It's going to have many huge debates. For example, Hussein Embers, as you can see at the bottom right of your screen, and Matt Delonte will be debating whether or not Islam is true. You don't want to miss it. So check out those links in the description box. And with that, we're going to kick it over to Randall. Thank you very much, Dr. Rouser. The floor is all yours for your opening as well. All right. Thanks for inviting me, James and Matt. It's great to be with you again debating. So I want to start with a quote from my favorite humanist, Carl Sagan. In his 1994 book, Pale Blue Dot, Sagan reflects on a photo of Earth taken in 1990 by the Voyager space probe from beyond the rings of Saturn. From that distance, 
the earth appears to be nothing more than a pale blue dot. Sagan wrote, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. Sagan goes on to describe eloquently the total aggregate of human existence, glorious and terrible, that has lived out life on this pale blue dot. As he put it, a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Sagan then laments human history in which we have spilled rivers of blood so that one person may have momentary mastery of a fraction of that dot. He then says we perpetuate endless cruelties on fellow human beings who are scarcely distinguishable from us. This well-known passage conveys three key elements of the humanist spirit, humility, nobility, and solidarity. The humility comes in the recognition that while our species has often fashioned ourselves kings of the world, standing on the prow of the Titanic, we are in fact more like a barnacle on the cosmic hull, eking out a marginal existence on a mote of dust. The nobility, uh, consider that we are the species that made that space probe, that took the picture, that can produce profound, haunting existential reflections inspired by it. As Blaise Pascal memorably put it, man is but a reed, the most feeble thing in nature, but he is a thinking reed. Finally, Sagan's words are a call to solidarity, to stand against the worst angels of our nature that lead us to dehumanize and objectify fellow human beings. Instead, we should seek out shared beliefs and values to unify us on this pale blue dot. Humility, nobility, solidarity, that may not exhaust what is meant by secular humanism today, but it's a fine starting point. And interestingly, Christianity shares important overlap with these three core humanist values. First, the Christian affirms humility about our station. As Ecclesiastes put it, smoke, nothing but smoke. There's nothing to anything. It's all smoke. In the famous Latin phrase that has characterized Christian funerary art, memento mori, remember you are mortal. And as we are currently in Lent, let us not forget Ash Wednesday liturgy. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Second, the Christian affirms human nobility. For the Christian, the heart of this confession is found in Genesis 1, 26, and 27. Human beings are created in the image of God and enjoy a unique status and a unique responsibility. Finally, solidarity. The heart of Christian teaching comes in Jesus Christ. Matt was certainly right about that, who taught his followers to love their neighbors as themselves. And then he went on to define neighbor as the one you are least likely to want to love. He also directed his followers to take up their cross daily in a life committed to solidarity with the least of these. And when Christians have aspired to do just that, like St. Francis of Assisi or Martin Luther King Jr., Christianity has shone the brightest. So the first thing I want to emphasize and underscore in this exchange is that Christianity and humanism are not scorched earth enemies. They do share much overlap in their values and interests with respect to human humility, nobility, and solidarity, and thus human flourishing. So now let's turn from the values that Christians and humanists share to the debate topic. The question is whether humanism is better for the world than Christianity. From my framework, the question can be put as, is humanism better at en enabling us to embody humility, nobility, and solidarity? I will argue that humanism isn't better. On the contrary, I believe Christianity is better at cultivating these shared values. Uh, one thing, however, I will happily concede that many historic expressions of Christianity or many Christians as individuals have not been effective at cultivating these pro-social goods, uh, certainly not as good as many secular humanists. For example, in the 19th century, the humanist and atheist Jeremy Bentham fought on the side of the angels when he opposed slavery against many of its Christian defenders. At the same time, note that Bentham fought shoulder to shoulder with the Christian abolitionist William Wilberforce. What I am defending is best described as mere Christianity centered on the Apostles' Creed and discipleship of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, let's turn to these three values. With respect to humility, Christianity and humanism share a strong recognition of human contingency and finitude, recognizing we are infinitesimally insignificant when contrasted with ultimate reality. Where Christianity differs, I think, is in the doctrine of original sin. Put simply, original sin refers to our incapacity to fulfill the end of being God's image bearers, or to put it, let's say, in Aristotelian terms, our incapacity to be people who exemplify virtue perfectly. The evidence of original sin is not hard to come by. 
In the 1930s, Germany was one of the most advanced civilizations on Earth, and yet it carried out one of the most heinous moral atrocities in human history. After the war, the philosopher Mary Warnock wrote that as the British learned of the Holocaust, she said, I reflected for the first time that humans have a great deal in common. I could not be sure that I did not have instincts as detestable as those of the Nazis, nor that I would have had the clarity of vision or the strength of character to resist these instincts had I been German at the time. That is the importance of a doctrine of original sin. It's not moral fatalism or misanthropy, but rather a sober recognition of our inability as individuals and collectives to behave consistently and perfectly in the way that Sagan laments in his famous pale blue dot reflection. Nobility. Why are human beings special? Well, we can look to human capacities, reason, imagination, self-consciousness, language use, but there is always a danger with tying human value to the actualization of specific capacities. This leaves on the margin human beings who fail to actualize those capacities, reason, language, self-consciousness, what have you. At this point, the Judeo-Christian tradition offers an important foundation for human worth, one that ranges over the entire species and is rooted in the above-mentioned concept of the Imago Dei, the image of God. Let's say you purchase a large collection of old books. As you look through it, you find that some of those books have an embosser stamp declaring them from the library of Mark Twain. Those books may not at all have any single feature in themselves that makes them more valuable than the other books in the collection, except that they have the embosser stamp. But every book that has that stamp has a value that is distinct from the other books, the value of being from the library of Mark Twain. The doctrine of Imago Dei is akin to saying that among living things, human beings on earth are unique in having the divine embossers stamp. Just as the book increases in value in virtue of being from the library of Mark Twain, so the human being gains a unique value in virtue of being in God's image, a value that exists independently of the individual's acquisition of any specific power like reason or language or imagination. And finally, solidarity. At the heart of Christianity is indeed the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. The most famous collection of Jesus's teaching is the Sermon on the Mount, which begins with the Beatitudes, consisting of blessings on all of those on the margins, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, uh, the meek, those who thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the poor in heart, the peacemakers, and the persecuted. Only the strong survive. History is told by the winners. He who dies with the most toys wins. Might makes right. These values of power have been enormously influential in human history. Dominant though they may be, they are deeply corrosive for those concerned to cultivate solidarity on the pale blue dot. Jesus challenges our valuation of the rich and powerful by inviting us to view all human beings as defined by inestimable value. The message, in short, is that we are all in need of grace, unmerited favor, and just as God in Jesus extends that grace to all, so we should do so to one another. Let me return to Martin Luther King Jr. When he was young, he had assumed that the ethic of Jesus to turn the other cheek and love your enemies was a fine teaching as far as it goes, but King did not see it as extending any further than offering reconciliation to alienated individuals. As King saw it, the teaching was simply not practical when applied to large groups, let alone nations. Eventually, however, King became convinced that following Jesus in radical nonviolence and self-denial could truly change the world. He reflected, I came to feel that this was the only morally and practically sound method open to oppressed people in their struggle for freedom. King also came to recognize that Jesus' love of enemies and commitment to nonviolence is not a method for cowards. It does resist. Indeed, it is a unique discipline that refuses to respond in kind to acts of aggression and humiliation, but instead to resolve to respond in the way of peace and nonviolence while extending the grace of humanity to the very one who oppresses. King added that with peaceful resistance must come, quote, a willingness to forgive, not seven times, but 70 times seven. The cross is an eternal expression of the length to which God will go in order to restore broken humanity. 
King recognized in Jesus a preeminently powerful and challenging model to admit our humility, honor our nobility, and embrace solidarity on the pale blue dot. I'm going to conclude now my remarks with one final comment, and this is on one additional criterion that we could identify, which I think Christianity has in um, more effectively embodied than humanism, that is hope. Specifically, a deepened sense of hope that motivates or should motivate to action. The hope is famously summarized by the words of King himself when he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it does bend toward justice. One day, God's kingdom foreshadowed in those beatitudes will come on earth as it is in heaven. This is not a call for the Christian or anyone to quietism, to doing nothing. Rather, Christians have recognized that hope is a rallying call to action. As the Apostle Paul put it, uh, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap harvest if we do not give up. In the words of John Wesley, do all the good you can to all by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can. Now, that is the vision of a Christian humanism by which we can cultivate a shared humanity together in emulation of Jesus Christ on this pale blue dot. Thank you very much for that opening as well, Dr. Rouser. We are going to jump into the open conversation, but I want to give you a couple of quick housekeeping things, folks. In particular, tonight, tonight's debate will be a little bit shorter than usual. We'll be doing about an hour and a half. So one additional thing before we go into the Q&A, or I should say the open discussion, is that Modern Day Debate is available on podcast. All of our debates end up on the podcast. It's ad-free. We want to make listening to these debates as easy easily available as possible so you can listen to them on the go so if you haven't yet pull out your phone or your favorite podcast app and find modern day debate and follow us so that you can listen to these debates on the go as all of them end up on the podcast within about 24 hours of them being live on youtube so with that we're going to jump into the open dialogue thanks very much gentlemen the floor is all yours well who's going to start i i have a question yeah maybe it'll sure. kick us off so Oddly, I mean, it's been it's been several years, but you and I debated once before. I think it was a team debate at that point, so we didn't get to talk quite as much. Um, yeah, I would agree with you that Christianity and humanism are not scorched earth enemies and that there is, in fact, some overlap. The part that bothers me, as many people would suspect, is, is the part where there's not an overlap that seems perhaps superfluous. And so when you said that in assessing whether or not there's a better world, you were going with mere Christianity centered on the Apostles' Creed. Which part of the Apostles' Creed addresses human flourishing at all? Because when I read the Apostles' Creed, it's, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. That has nothing to do with human flourishing. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, His Lord, or our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, buried, ascended to hell, the third day rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty, and then will come to judge the living and the dead. Apart from the potential judgment thing, there's nothing in there that has to do with human flourishing. And then finally, it's, I believe, in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, which we can toss that out. Uh, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, uh, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. There's literally, apart from judging, there's nothing in there that addresses human flourishing, and that judgment addresses human flourishing with respect to a, a next life. So how is the Apostles' Creed relevant to making daily life better for humans? Well, so first of all, the um, uh, sidebar, but but you don't toss out the Catholic. It's small c Catholic. Catholicos is just universal church. It's not referencing Roman Catholic. That's why Protestants and others can confess it. Yes. Oh, okay. But um, <clears throat> so the, the central, the heartbeat, as I'm sure you recognize, of the Apostle Creed is Jesus, right? It's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's all about human flourishing. So why, what is this atoning death about? It's about restoring us to relationship with God, with fellow human beings, with other creatures, and indeed with ourselves. That's the whole point. Um, the idea of Jesus' a resurrection is not just a one-off party trick. It is, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, the idea of the first fruits of our future resurrection. The idea that human life has a telos or goal or a purpose toward which it is directed. 
Uh, so, I mean, I think the whole thing properly understood. Oh, and, and then in terms of, of reference to the community of faith afterwards, all part of human flourishing, recognizing the importance of human relationships and so on, recognizing God as creator. I mean, we have to understand who is God under what kind of being is this for our Christians? And I know uh, there are many caricatures as, as to what a Christian or a theist would believe, but what I would understand God to be as a concept in its essence, I think is aptly described by Anselm, that being then which none greater can be conceived. In other words, God is a maximally great being. God is coextensive with whatever is maximally good, great, perfect, all those things. So human flourishing would be that which is lived in actualization with or in right relationship with that which is perfect, or which is the perfect manifestation of the good, right? What Plato would have called the, the form of the good, uh, what a Christian would understand to be the triune God. So I think the whole thing is framed uh, with respect to human flourishing. But the one thing I'd want to emphasize, which I have tried to underscore for this debate, because I agree with you the way I interpreted the question is we're not debating the truth of these respective worldviews per se. What we're talking about is which one of them offers a better framework here and now in the four score and seven years we have on planet Earth for human flourishing. Uh, and I do believe that for the reasons I gave that Christianity does structure uh, that effectively. Yeah, I, I swear I'm not trying to be obtuse, but when you say Jesus is all about human flourishing, um, what about Jesus? impacts my flourishing in the world right now? I, can you state the question again? I'm mean, obviously... Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, can, so the issue here is I'm going to... I'm, I'm 54 as of yesterday. Uh, hooray, I survived one more loop around the sun. And I have... I don't know how many more birthdays in the future, but I would like to um, have as many as is reasonable and have a life that is uh, good and better. Now, if I just run around all willy-nilly without a thought for anybody else, I'm probably not going to have that good of a life. But if I adopt the principles of secular humanism, I can. What is it about Jesus and a belief in Jesus that would make my life better from now until I'm dead? I would want to say it's, it, I don't want to talk uh, or focus on belief in Jesus. I want to focus on living a life in emulation of Jesus. Uh, Jesus himself okay. talks in uh, Matthew 25, where he distinguishes the sheep from the goats. And the sheep are defined as those who have undertaken these particular actions, right? To visiting those in prison, comforting those who mourn, feeding those who are hungry. That's what the sheep are defined like. So the one thing I would say is that's the life Jesus modeled for us. When I talk about a life of an individual taking up their cross, what what a that is a metaphor for is living a life of not just self-denial, but loving your neighbor as yourself. So it's not just a denial of yourself, but it's a recognition that the fulfillment of yourself comes in right relationship with others, something that Jesus modeled and taught us to do. And that as we live that out by his authority and within that framework of understanding human flourishing, then what happens um, in the reconciliation of enemies, like I think is so well expressed in the civil rights movement, that is a result and human flourishing is the result. Can I ask uh, just to turn it around sure. to you? Um, you, had an, you, you had an interesting discussion or, or, or recognition. You have some people that were humanists and then they, they believe, well, there's something missing there in terms of, of um, the animal kingdom. It was interesting when I, I read through the, the number three humanist manifesto today, the most recent one. And uh, when I read it, it was the way that it described the value of nature around us was seemed to be derivative of hum, human flourishing, um, which is so I understand in a sense where, why there is a kind of pushback to say, well, shouldn't we recognize the value of, of creation or nature, of sentient creatures, of ecosystems in themselves and not just with respect to human flourishing. Would you recognize that that's a weakness in the expression of humanism as you hold it? Well, are, could, one more time with what, what part is the weakness? So the idea that, that, um, that, that, uh, what your friends were pushing back on, it seems to me is, is that nature, uh, and sentient creatures and ecosystems 
are not intrinsically valuable in themselves, but rather only derivatively in so far as they impact human beings or are required for the flourishing of human beings. Yeah, well, so I, I, I don't know that that would be a problem with humanism since humans are the focus. My, the people that I was talking about, just for clarity, um, are ethical vegans who don't think that humanism goes far enough to protect um, other potential or, or other animals. And so I, I guess what what I would mean, what I would just rephrase that then is, do you sense that what the, the strength of their arguments that there's a limitation in humanism as an ethical value system in that it makes the rest of nature in its value derivative upon human flourishing? No, I think that's a mistake on their part. I don't I okay. don't mind that things are uh, derivative. So I am always going to value myself first, the people nearer to me. Uh, in their circles, you know, second, and then it, it goes out, it, it branches out. The further we get away from me, both geographically and uh, familially, and by the way, I'm not talking about necessarily bloodline, um, just my capacity, as I think is true for anybody, um, to fully empathize and 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 value uh, begins to diminish. But as basic principles, I hold that um, human beings by virtue of merely being human beings, and which makes me absolutely unapologetically speciesist, um, have value. It's not They don't have value because they're created in the image of God. They have value. My life's valuable because it's valuable to me. Your life's valuable because it's valuable to you. Your life matters to me because our lives are intertwined. That sort of thing. It's, it doesn't need some external justification. It is a recognition that as long as we're here sharing space, uh, it's far, we know, from game theory, it's far better for us to work cooperatively than it is to struggle. Um, and so, that so on your view, for both of us. On, on your view, human life is only valuable relative to the individual whose life it is who happens to value their own life. So it's just a purely subjective valuation of the individual of their own life, and then of other individuals only derivatively insofar as it impacts their life. Well, it's it's just a, day, a recognition that since I value my life, it's reasonable for me to conclude that everybody else is going to value their life. And so I value their life as well because their lives impact my life. Um, you can get to, you know, purely altruistic things or things that are equivalent to what we perceive to be altruism from selfish means. And in, in order for me to live the best life I can, it's in my best interest to work cooperatively with other people, including people that I don't necessarily like or agree with. Um, because if I don't, you know, what chance do I have of changing minds or impacting the world and that sort of thing? The the value is just asserted. Um, you know, it's not, it's not much different from saying that humans have uh, value because they're created in God's image. The difference being we're not trying to claim that they have value for something we can't prove. If If your view is that humans have value because they're created in God's image, how do you prove that? And what do you do with the people who don't believe that? Instead, if you begin with humans have value, period, you're done. So, yeah, but so it seems to me on your view, it's it's a pretty radically subjective concept of human value. That humanism, as you understand it, is simply certain people have happen to like themselves. Obviously, not everybody does. Not everybody likes themselves. Not everybody likes their life. But if you do, um, then you could be a humanist just because you happen to subjectively value your own life. You could be a humanist um, whether you value your own life or not. You can agree with the principles. Well, so so you've defined your you, your understanding of humanism as so. I, what I'm here is. Uh, we came to the dance together in a sense. So if you want to talk about Christianity, don't talk about those people who support Donald Trump. You got to talk to me. And if I want to talk about humanism, I'm not, not going to talk about the people that don't value their own life. I'll talk to you, right? Because on no, your no, no. understanding of humanism, you've defined it in this way. No, no. I could I could reach a point tomorrow where I no longer value my own life, but I would still be a humanist. Um, I might I might reach a point tomorrow where because of a terminal illness or because my suffering now outweighs um, my capacity uh, to enjoy life, I might no longer wish to continue living, but I would still be a humanist. I would still be someone who advocates for those principles because I recognize that it's not just about me. This is this is the key thing, or one of one of the key things of humanism is that it's not just oh I like my life and therefore I'm going to like everybody else's life. It's a recognition that this is true for nearly everybody. Yes, there are exceptions, um, but you don't 
you don't make guidelines based on the exceptions. You make your guidelines based on who humans are and what they do. And, and recognizing yeah. that I, so for example, I don't think that there's, you, you will, you will possibly disagree. I don't think that there's any reasonable way to make the Bible appear to hold men and women equal, but I do. And I continue to support that position. I mean, when, when you have different rules for who can own property and what kind of property and who can speak in church and who can't speak in church and telling wives to submit yourself to the husband as to the Lord, you've created a hierarchy. Um, and I get it. Not it, This is what the Bible says. This isn't necessarily a Christian model that everybody accepts, but you create a hierarchy that is necessarily, by definition, unequal. My perception or my, my, my position is that from a humanist perspective, there isn't a perceived inequality in value or position or status in the world from with regard to humanism. And so if someone holds that Christianity is better for the world than humanism, one of the things they would have to do is either point out that their version of Christianity doesn't have that hierarchy or show why that hierarchy is better, right? Well, yeah, certainly I'm an egalitarian um, in gender relations. But um, let's say that, that you have... Um, like an anencephalic a child born without a cerebrum. Uh, they're an orphan they're, and there's there's nobody who loves them, right? They're at an orphanage in Romania or somewhere. And um, what makes that child of value? If they're, they're not, they can't value themselves and nobody values them. What makes that individual child of value, of valuable? Humanism. The, the very principle is this person has and, and by the way it doesn't necessarily we're not saying that all life is equally valuable or that you know it's, that there aren't one of the one of the nice things about humanism is that it it, it, it advocates in, in oh i'm gonna get in trouble because i'm advocating for stuff that there are humanists who may not agree with but for example death with dignity and, and medical assistance in dying i just removed myself from a convention but i'm now back a part of it because they were supporting a catholic charity that was opposed to medical assistance in dying what th there's nothing that makes or grants any baby, no matter what issue or condition, uh, doesn't imbue it with value. And it doesn't make any difference to say, oh, it has value because it's created in God's image, because not only can you not prove that, but that doesn't also mean that it has value. It might have value to God, but it doesn't have value to the to the person sitting next to you. And so if the issue here is, why do we value this? It's because as humanists, we recognize that we're going to afford all human beings the rights and privileges that we would like to have. Uh, well, of course, I can't prove my views. You can't prove your views. So arguing that one can't prove the views of the other is not in and of itself, um, you know, a, a point that sustains the opposing position because they're both in the same point, in the same boat. <clears throat> well, Okay, then if you remove that and say, okay, Matt can't demonstrate that this person has any value, and I can't demonstrate that this person has any value, so we'll just call that uh, a wash and ignore whether or not individuals have value. Because the, if my system says they have value and your system says they have value, and we and, and neither of us under under your your model there can demonstrate that we can demonstrate the truth of whether or not they have value, um, which I think we actually can, because I can sit here and say. I value other people. Do you value other people? I think you do. And so my position that human beings value other people is demonstrably true. Can you do a demonstration like that for whether or not God values a person? So uh, the way that I think we come to, one way to, to come to a recognition of human value is through our moral intuitions. Uh, so for example, let's say that you have uh, a building and it, there's two rooms in the building. And in one room, there is like 10 sentient, uh, well, of course, sentient, there's 10 self-conscious chimps that have been tr become relatively sophisticated language users like Bubbles the Chimp or something over several years in a research study. Enormously valuable chimps. And in the other room is a single human infant and a uh, fire breaks out and there's only time to go into the one room and save the 10 shims or to the other room and save the one infant. Personally, I have very strong intuitions that whatever you're going to say about the chimps um, and how important they are and how much language they've learned 
that one human child should have priority. So um, what I want to do then, because those are, for me, very strong moral intuitions, what we want to do then is try to find some basis to justify those moral intuitions. I see it insofar as what you're doing is you want to map humanism onto those values. Some people, uh, onto those intuitions, some people would, as I referenced in my opening statement, would want to map well because they are either rational beings or something or they have the potential to develop rationality, which I think is is a is a weak position for the reasons I briefly gave in my opening statement. What I would think is is the best way, because I'm a Christian, I've already got this doctrine of the Imago Dei, and it conforms very nicely with my moral intuitions about the moral significance of human beings. So there's a really interesting interlocking there and mutual reinforcement or dovetailing of my Judeo-Christian beliefs and of these deeply held moral intuitions about the moral significance of human beings. Yeah, so... It's not surprising that your moral intuitions would line up with your perception based on Imago Dei. I would argue that that's what you're trying to match up to. Um, but you also mentioned that you, you, we have these moral intuitions and we're trying to justify them. And I, I would argue that's not what I'm trying to do. I want to find out if they're correct, if they are the best, if my moral intuitions are accurate in this would lead to a better world. I want to see if they are justifiable not try to find a way to justify them. And so the 10 chimps in one world in one room versus one infant, um, all of these moral dilemmas annoy the crap out of me. <laughs> not, not your fault. They always will because they don't include enough information and they always create a, a bizarre scenario where you have to make this choice in order. it's, it's there on purpose to push your moral intuitions. But what if one of those chimps has the cure for cancer? Like its blood now will cure millions of human beings. Does that mean that it's now more valuable than that baby? I don't know. I think it probably is. But I don't like to do these kind of math with lives scenarios because it may be that there is no good option and that I can value 10 chimps and a baby equally or 100 chimps and a baby. Or maybe one chimp and one human baby. I may, maybe I maybe there's scenarios under which we can. At the end of the day, though, what you know, um, the moral intuition that I would have as a Christian is that it's you're going for the baby first all day, every day, every single time. There's no scenario uh, under which you're going to say that because I have no reason to think that chimps are going to in, inherit an afterlife. On the other hand. I could also argue from a Christian perspective that maybe it's better for me to save the chimps because if God has a plan and this was God's plan and nothing can happen that doesn't go according to God's plan, then me saving the chimps was God's plan. You can kind of, you can kind of do this dance thing. At the end of the day, that's about what you're valuing. I don't want to find out if my moral intuitions can be justified because that leads to potential rationalization. I want to find out are they correct or do I have good reason to think they're correct? And if the only reason that I have to think that they're correct is because they're consistent with other things that I can't demonstrate, like what a God thinks, uh, then I'm, I'm just kind of sitting there engaged in, in a sort of mental moral masturbation. Instead, if I try to ground this in something that says, okay, we are going to say that human beings are afforded the same rights and freedoms and status by default as a general principle. And that we, 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 um, what's the right word? Um, we set aside those rights and freedoms only when there's sufficient reason. Like we, ha we have, have a reason to lock somebody up. We have to have a reason to, you know, imprison them, for, you know, after committing a crime or something like that. Um, there are times where because of what they've done, people are no longer, uh, no longer have equal rights. But if we begin with that foundation of autonomy, what, what's a reason not to begin with that foundation just as a fiat declaration that men and women are equal, that human beings should have be afforded uh, equal treatment and consideration under the law and with regard to their social status and all that? Well, we well, first of all, let me let me just come back to so the, the language sure. of justify them. So I, I don't actually I think those are properly basic beliefs. So I believe I'm a moderate foundationalist. So we begin 
uh, when we experience certain things, we form beliefs immediately upon them based upon certain experiences, data, and so on. And so when I contemplate an issue like that, my my the point of it being properly basic is there's no process of ratiocination, no deduction or induction or abductive process by which I draw the conclusion that I should save the infant over the 10 uh, chimps. And, I, and I, I, I missed something. I apologize. I missed something. Are you saying that moral intuitions are properly basic? An intuition is properly basic, whether it's a moral okay. one or it's a rational one. For example, a rational intuition would be uh, nothing can be taller than itself, or nothing can be red and green all over at the same time. Right? That's like a rational intuition, or uh, the laws of of uh, Aristotle's laws of thought, right? The law of non contradiction, etc. Those are rational intuitions. Moral intuitions are, are properly basic beliefs that we form based simply based upon uh, reflection of issues or experiences of things, just like we form sense perceptual beliefs based simply upon sense perceptual experience. In the same way that if you, you look out the window and you see that it's sunny outside and you immediately form the belief it's sunny outside with any ratiocinative process, if you look out the side and you see a person getting sexually assaulted or beaten to death, you immediately form the belief that what's happening is wrong. Um, and in the same way, those are both beliefs that are formed immediately. Um, so when I was saying justify them, I wasn't uh, seeing that in a literal sense of they have to be epistemically justified. But what we do want to say is, okay, to what degree can my intuitions, which are not infallible, I mean, none of our beliefs are, is infallible. So what we do want to do in terms of uh, building up our noetic frameworks, ensuring that they're as rational as they can be, is to test them, test those intuitions, see if they if they can be embedded properly into a broader noetic set of beliefs we hold. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about with respect to that. And so I think that the recognition that human beings do have some kind of status, which I referred to analogously with an embosser, right, in, in a book, uh, that tracks well to without, and I mean, if if it is a value that comes in virtue of being val of special value or like status by the creator and source of all things and of all good, that's a, a pretty strong rational ground in which to assent to the value of that thing versus the subjective individual valuation of oneself because one happens to like oneself and be oneself and then to extend derivatively that same value to other creatures so that you can collectively flourish more for as long as you happen to be on the planet. Yeah. Well, we went, you, first of all, I, I generally reject the notion of properly basic beliefs um, because I'm not convinced that there's um, like a non-doxastic non -doxastic justification. I think beliefs are always tied to other beliefs that we have. But setting true. that aside, That's true. if if we're going to if we're going to say as you, as you did, uh, if you're going to tie this to a morally perfect being, and earlier we were talking about how we weren't able to address the truth of these things, then really what you're saying is that you're tying it to your belief that there's a morally perfect being and your belief that you have an understanding of what that morally perfect being wants or is or expects or would value. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm always going to so I if you have get away those, from my own beliefs. That is true. Sure. But so we have, I'm sitting here saying human beings are equal, period. Just, just as a, a starting foundation, where they go after that based on what they do is, is separate. But we're going to start with, as far as value and rights and everything else, boom, human beings are equal. And the, the only reason for that is that we are the ones who guard and protect rights. We are the ones that uh, enshrine and codify what rights people are going to have. And so it's up to us to say, boom, uh, you know, here's at the outset, human beings are going to start on, you know, with equality. In your case, you're saying human beings are equal because I believe that there's a perfect being who made them in his image and that their purpose is to exemplify um, that or, or strive to exemplify that sort of perfection. So I have a declaration and you have a declaration that you have some extra justification for. Uh, I don't see any way to demonstrate that justification, but if that justification were to be true, how would being in God's image make you more equal than what humanism says? 
I realize, heard, more equal, I realize more equal is a problematic phrase, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, so when you said, when you're describing your view, you were saying human beings um, codify and recognize rights. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, not all human beings do that. Some human beings, as in the anencephalic orphan I, I wasn't Romania, saying that every single unable. person codifies rights. I'm saying that humans... So we some do and some don't. We are, so, we, so it doesn't matter if some do and some species. don't. What I'm saying is that humanity... Human yeah. beings codify and guarantee and protect rights. They, that is the only way that rights exist is by our action. I guess I'm I'm here with with your uh, vegan friends pushing back on what, uh, but you kind of owned it, calling it speciesism. But it, it does seem arbitrary. And I'm not saying that relative to my view, my view could be, cons you could say, well, your view is arbitrary because why did God choose this species? Well, I, I don't have to argue for God here, but you do have to argue for yourself. So I, I still am left saying, like, not all creatures, human beings recognize those rights. Not all of them are able to exercise rights or will ever be able to exercise rights. Why is that significant to map that then onto this collective species? There are no rights except for what we codify and protect. You don't have a right to anything unless we, as a collective, say you have that right and we are going to protect that right. It makes no sense to say I have a right that nobody is going to protect or guarantee. But the question was, if I say humans are equal, and that's just the beginning point, that we're going to assert that as the foundation for the decisions we're going to make about how to codify rights, and you say human beings are equal, but you say they're equal because they you're, you're convinced they're in the image of God. My question was, how does being in the image of God make them valuable? God is not just another person in the room. Uh, God is understood to be the maximal exemplification of goodness itself, of moral value, of obligation. So to ask, why is something valuable in virtue of being in special relationship with the source of all good, I mean, it's sort of a confused question in a sense. Now, there are other conceptions of God where that is a fair question, but I don't think on this one. You said, um, to come back at, at another direction, you said, there are no there are no rights unless we recognize it as a collective. So then you sort of ask, so if the collective decides not to recognize the right not to be tortured or something like that, correct? does it follow that we don't have the right not to be tortured? It only Correct. depends upon the subjective assent. Okay, then then how many human beings have to assent to a right in order for it to exist? What, whatever. So, so for example, once upon a time, women didn't have the right to vote in the United States, and neither did African Americans, and we granted that right. There's a difference between what right they have and what right they should have. And so under a, under a foundation of equality, if the United States had been started on humanist principles, women and African Americans would have had a right to vote from the beginning. But because that wasn't the foundation, they had a different foundation for this. They did not have those rights and later had to fight for those rights. And then we grant them. But at the time, yeah. you know, a hundred years ago when women couldn't vote, to say I have the right to vote would have been false. To say I should have the right to vote could well be true because we're talking about what ought to be underneath a particular system. Okay, and under the so, humanist system, yeah. they should have had the right to vote. Under a Christian system, should they have had the right to vote? Yeah. What, they should have? I believe so, yeah. What, what's the um, foundation under Christianity to suggest that they should have had a right to vote? Uh, what, women? Yeah. The Imago Dei. So uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27 the image of God, male and female together, exemplify the image of God perfectly. But wives are supposed to be subject to their husband. Uh, so that's when you when you want to get into, I'm not a complementarian. So if you want to have a debate about how to understand complementarian verses, that's a different debate to have. But Genesis 126, 27 is a foundational text with reference to what human beings are. And human beings are equal, made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 is actually a pretty revolutionary text in the ancient world. Um, so, so you said initially, there are no rights unless we recognize it as a collective. But then when I asked you, well, 
So it seems like then the rights are created by simple assent of a certain number of human beings. Then you distinguish between, there's a distinction between having the right and whether they should have the right. Yes. Uh, so what that then seems to be is there are rights irrespective of whether human beings recognize them or not. The question is whether human beings will recognize the right, such as the no, right no. that a woman should have to vote. It, it's, so not it like our, like it's not like a right exists as a thing and then we codify it. Uh, when so, you say so I should have this said right, should, yeah. when you say should have this right, you're saying under the principles of this system, what should be permissible? That's it. And and it's possible for the system, for example, the, the government of the United States, to not be consistent with its own values and positions. The fact that we the fact that we talk about all men are created equal doesn't mean that all men were created equal. We we had a system here in the United States that included uh a a lip service to all men are uh endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights and all men are created equal. And then we have a three-fifths compromise in order to value some men as worth less, even though before we had the three-fifths compromise, they were worth nothing. And so it's possible for human beings to get it wrong, to say, here's the things that I value, and then in action, fail to do that. And so when so, I say they yeah. should have had a right, I'm yeah. saying if humanism had been the foundation of the United States, women and African Americans would have had the right to vote from the beginning, wouldn't have had to fight for it. Humanism, as you said, equality. humanism, as you said yourself, um, is always changing. Open, it's open to changing. Uh, you said even it's kind of, uh, I don't know what the, the term you used, an unfair debate or an asymmetric or whatever burden, because there's an openness to humanism, to adaptation, to change. Um, now, with that in mind, could, could humanism change in the future where it's no longer considered consistent with humanist values to extend a right to vote to women? No. That couldn't happen? You could know no. that a priori. No, it's not a priori. It's a posteriori. It's because we already know there, there comes a point where at the beginning, you may not know all the best things, but at least you've narrowed your focus as you begin to learn more about what could be in the pool of right. And let, until something comes along that shows that allowing women to vote is somehow anti-human or anti-equality, then that couldn't happen. And if it happens, then now you're in a conflict because women are humans. So they have to have those rights. So no, nothing could happen that could could make the the denying women the right to vote consistent with the values of human equality. Uh, is it possible that equals MC squared could be overturned in the future? I have no idea. I, I possible. I mean, the, the I, interesting I thing is that at I don't the end of the nineteenth. Yeah, but at the end of the 19th century, physics was was physicists widely believed physics was basically closed. There were there were no longer big questions to be answered. It was all working out to the 10th decimal point. And then along comes a paradigm shift, and now E equals MC squared and relativity theory changes everything. So I think I'd be pretty cautious about saying you couldn't have conceivably another paradigm shift. No, I, I this science. is about this, this isn't a paradigm shift. This is saying, can there be a married bachelor? If the declaration, if the foundational declaration of humanism is that humans, irrespective of gender, are equal, then you cannot then have a, we're not going to let women, we're going to let men vote, but not women vote. You can't have that. So, so any person who would, that's a very essentialist definition of what humanism is, when it kind of gets down into the fine well, grained outward. I'm sorry that it's essentialist to say that women are human beings, but they are. Well, that that's that's not the the issue is is yeah humanism is the idea that human beings are the the normative status or criterion for human flourishing. It's it's one step removed to say therefore everybody should have an equal right to vote, right? It's not the same thing. It's not a logical entailment. I think it's uh, something you should affirm. The question is how do you affirm it? Uh, you say it's a posteriori and that humanism could never possibly change, and yet. You grounded on the same basic framework empirically of gaining new evidence from the world around you that presumably you do through things like natural science. And yet we can't have confidence in natural science that paradigms cannot be overturned. I'm sorry. Or I'm sorry. I, was, I was doing the charitable listening thing where I presumed when you asked the question that what we were asking here is, 
would it be fair, would it be reasonable in the future under humanism for women to not be allowed to vote, but men to not be allowed to vote, or to, but men to be allowed to vote as just categories? Is there a circumstance under, under which some woman might be not denied vote? Yeah, especially if they're a felon. Is there a position under which all women would be denied the right to vote? Yes, if we removed voting from everyone. But as long as the foundational principle is people have these rights, and as long as women are people, it's just set theory that there's no circumstance under which women don't have those rights in that system. This is not, this is, this is simple. I mean, this is set theory logic 101. If women are people and so, people so have this right, then there's no circumstance in, well, in that scenario. Uh, the second premise, have people have this right, is the one that I'm asking about, right? <laughs> You're just assuming that that could never change. That every no, person no, no, no. should have this I'm right. I'm talking, oh my gosh. Is it possible that under a humanist regime, humanists could get together and deny women the right to vote and be inconsistent with their own values? Sure. But it's just as possible as the United States saying all men are created equal, but they're not. I'm not talking about what, what individuals may do in getting it wrong. I'm talking about what is consistent with the principles of humanism. And if humanism begins with you're all equal and men and women are both human, then any any proposition that says, okay, we're going to exclude women from human is inconsistent with the values. Could it happen? Sure. I suppose there's a despot somewhere who could claim to be a humanist and then do the most antithetical things to humanism. But that's not a that's not an indictment on humanism. If we're going to compare humanism and Christianity and which one's better for the world, you don't get to pretend that there's a tin pot des uh, you know despot out there, tinfoil, I can't even get the, the phrase right, who's going to ignore the values of humanism. You might as well be saying, is it possible for, for there to be uh, Christians out there who are calling for the slaughter of every person on the planet except for Randall? Yeah, it's possible. Only in a really wacko logical sense, it's not realistic, and it's not an indictment of Christianity. It's an indictment of those people. So if you're going to try to indict humanism, you don't get to say, is there a scenario under which some people might ignore the principles of humanism while claiming they're underneath the principles? I can give you a quick response, Randall. We do have to wrap up, though. I have to say that I get to give you guys a two-minute warning. So sure. if you guys are able to each get a response in that two minutes, great. Otherwise, I do just have to let you know that in order to have about 16 to 17 minutes of q and I've got to kind of push us in there and, like I said, two minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, Matt, I'm not trying to exasperate you. So uh, I do thank you for, for the exchange tonight. I think for, for me, the, the big thing is in terms of our, our rights, things that exist independently of human thoughts about them. In other words, in that sense, are the objective rather than relative to the thoughts of human persons and the social recognition of them. Uh, and yeah, so I'll just, uh, if, if you want to just come back to that one with, with one final time, and then I could turn it over to James. Oh, I don't, I don't need to come back on that. There were a bunch of other questions. I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't have more time because it's like you talked about Christianity giving us hope, but I would say that Christianity doesn't give us hope for this life. It gives us hope for a next life. And so I don't see how hope's relevant to this. You know, the, the, there's this, the righteousness of this life is like dirty rags and God gives trials uh, equally and inequally to people. And this earth is set for tribulation, war, turmoil, turmoil. That, and that sounds like American dispensationalism. That that's that's not mere Christianity. It's certainly not an entailment of the Apostles' Creed. Mere Christianity, entailment of the Apostles' Creed includes judgment of the living and the dead, resurrection yeah, of the and, body. Yeah, and life everlasting. Uh, life so everlasting the, here on earth. Yeah. Yeah, the Christian doctrine is new heavens and new earth, which is new heaven, the new earth, which so, is the which. No, Matt, let I'm me sorry. let me. Okay, I wrote a book on heaven, so I mean I could address these well, topics. Congratulations, thank you. So this, so uh, the the the, the, the res, I'll, uh, James, I'll just answer this and then uh, we'll turn it back to you. Thank you for your forbearance for for both of you. So so uh, I, I mentioned earlier the resurrection of Jesus is the first fruits of creation in Christian theology. His resurrection body, the body that was raised, is the same body that was laid in the ground. The tomb was empty. First fruits means that's the first beginning of the restoration of all things. Uh, when when you read in places like Second Peter about the new heavens and new earth, just like bo Jesus' body was new, uh, that is renewed—a renewed body, a renewed heavens, a new earth. That's why Paul in Romans eight talks about creation groaning, waiting for itself to be liberated because it's waiting for the restoration of all things. To think about earth and heaven opposed is Greek and Platonic thinking. It's not Judeo-Christian 
theology of the afterlife. I've got to push. So I mean, that's the, a quick. It, yeah, it's not. Push. So when it says, I, I hate to do this, but I, I do. I really do have to push this into the Q and A just because we have such a short amount of time. I know you've got another round in the chamber, Matt, ready to go. So I'm sorry to do this to you, but just because we do have to wrap up so fast tonight, I do want to jump in. This one, I want to jump into the questions. I want to say if you guys can also do me a favor, Randall and Matt, we're going to try to get through these with ideally as few rebuttals to the answer of the question as possible. And folks also want to let you know, we do have only about 15 minutes of Q&A for tonight. So it's going to be really short and sweet. Only super chats of $10 or more are going to be read as we're trying to make these as high of quality as possible. And frankly, as few as possible as we have very limited time. This one coming in first from Kia Star 67. Thanks for your positivity and your kind words. So just showing support, like one of the chatters asked. Great channel. Thanks so much. Thanks for your kind words. That means a lot. And all credit to the speakers who are linked in the description. If you'd like to hear more, especially on these topics that came up through the debate, you can check out Matt's and Randall's links below. Randall has a link that is for his, a book related to these topics in the description box. And I have linked Matt's YouTube channel in the description box as well. This one coming in from Native Atheist says, if you rely on a being for morality, Dr. Rouser, then that's not objective. What are your thoughts, Dr. Rouser? Um, so uh, the way that I've described it here is so objective is something independent of the thoughts, beings of human beings. Now, for, for God, basic moral values are not things that are that are a result of God's will. It's not like God wills. It's not a radical voluntarism. They're simply understood to be identical with him. So it's sort of the, the idea of the platonic good uh, on this understanding would be an, an identification with the divine nature. So it's not that God wills evil and wills good, th those respective values. It's rather that God is identical with this thing which transcends nature, and we human beings recognize moral values. This one coming in from Dan Shire says, great job tonight to both Matt and Dr. Rouser says, very engaging and interesting. I've got to tell you guys, this has been one of the more cordial, deep, insightful talks. I'm just grateful that I've gotten to moderate this myself. So I want to say thank you guys. It has been awesome. They say, it's because you're you, here and we're afraid of you. <laughs> they say, while you each are arguing that your view is better, quote unquote, than the other, would either of you argue that the opposing view is bad or in any way harmful i don't well, know if they mean as a general rule to be or... fair to Go be ahead. fair we I, I would need to have a, a better understanding of randall's specific version of christianity um because most of the things that i think i'm i, I would launch into as being clearly worse um he, he may not espouse to he, he doesn't hold that women uh hold a second tier to men for example um but when he talks about sorry uh, new heaven, new earth, and the judgment of people who've been dead, that's an afterlife. If you've been dead and you're revived to be judged, that's an afterlife. That's not this life. And there's no demonstration that that life exists. And when your entire system is focused on benefiting that life, that's not benefiting this life. Okay, yeah, I know I shouldn't get back into this. I, um, just to be sure that we don't go too far into yeah, that topic, I, I do want to give you a chance. Be, Randall, the yeah. original question was whether or not secular humanism has the potential for harm. I What I would like to say is there are expressions of Christianity and expressions of secular humanism that do harm. And what I tried to emphasize in my opening statement at the beginning was the degree to which Matt and I or humanists and Christians can share a common project of human flourishing. And when Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of God has come now. What he was, the kingdom of God is about restoring justice about comforting the oppressed, et cetera, which is something that starts now, not just in the afterlife. We're going to jump into the next one. Thank you very much. GSP says, Matt values other people, but I don't understand the point. They say the question is, why would Hitler or child sex traffickers or drug cartels be obligated to value other people rather than seek their own profit rather than others? Why would they be obligated to? They're not. You can be an asshole. You can be a monster. You cannot value people if you don't want to. Um, the issue here is about what makes the world better. If you think that Hitler makes the world better, I don't know how to respond to that. This one coming in from, do appreciate it. Snaky Jake 9 says, if humanism is superior to Christianity in valuing human life and, quote, all humans are equal irrespective of gender. Why do most humanists support abortion while Christians holding to traditional teachings reject it outright? 
Which one of this is it for? I think it's for you, Matt, but I could be wrong. Okay. It, at worst, in the case of a pregnancy, at worst you have the rights of two people in conflict, and so you're saying that one person doesn't have the right to use another person's body without their consent. That That is the foundational thing, that this person is autonomous and gets to make decisions about their body and who's going to use it. That's why humanists tend to be uh, supportive of abortion rights. This one from GSP says, So in Uganda, if they codify that gay people shouldn't have rights anymore, I guess, would Matt support their right to codify their own rights? I don't have any say in what Uganda can or can't do, um, but it's inconsistent with humanism. I don't know why this is so difficult. To, I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for a humanistic world being a better world. And I've got people questioning, oh, should Hitler be able to do this? What difference does that make? That's not humanism. Why'd you bring up Hitler? Oh, it's because you know it's a worse world. So you picked an example that's absolutely the antithesis of humanism to say it's a worse world. And now you're going to Uganda. Should, I, do I think Uganda should be doing this? Absolutely not. I don't know what the solution is to their laws that are opposed to LGBT people. Um, but that's not humanism. So I don't, I don't see how this is a challenge to humanism. This one coming in from Thidges Up De Weg says, are there any intersections where humanism and Christianity meet and might be a starting point? I think they mean a starting point to working harmoniously together. I certainly would like to think so. That's why I was trying to emphasize that. And with reference to Carl Sagan, I thought it'd be a great olive branch to begin with Carl Sagan. I love Carl Sagan. Um, I often disagree with him, but I just as often agreed with him. And what I tried to summarize there in terms of uh, solidarity, nobility, humility, uh, which I think he beautifully encapsulated in that passage, I think it's a common project we can work on. However long we are on this earth and whether there's a life in the afterlife, we need to learn to get along here now. And, and I'm largely in agreement. I mean, Randall and I are going to agree on a great many things, especially if the things I object to about Christianity aren't part of his. Um, but when you say that it's centered on the Apostles' Creed, uh, I find nothing in the Apostles' Creed that is consistent with humanism or supportive of human flourishing, um, despite his assertion that Jesus is all about human flourishing. This one coming in from GSP says, Randall, would you agree that a human is no more important than any other animal or even an insect if God does not exist? No. No. That this, doesn't follow. This one from Gregory06 says, Dr. Rouser, do you agree with every Bible verse, such as areas of slavery or rules you don't follow? If not, then you're just doing your own cherry picking they say what's your method for truth finding in the bible well i wrote a book called jesus loves canaanites where i offered a reading of and a critique of apologetic defenses of canaanite genocide it's a 350 page book which i'm not going to summarize here but that's my method and yeah it's it's not just pick cherry picking this one coming in from, do appreciate it, Lord Stannis says, Dr. Rouser, was it wrong to murder, mur I think they are saying, is it wrong to murder murderers or kill murderers before humans evolved? Or maybe they're saying, was it wrong to murder before humans evolved? And will it still be wrong to murder after humans go extinct? If not, uh, how is your theistic morality truly independent of human opinion? Well, so if something is murder by definition of the meaning of the word murder, as I understand it, it's wrong. So killing would be a neutral term. And there are all sorts of contexts in which it is morally justified to kill people and other contexts in which it is not. But I don't believe moral facts about how human beings should act first emerged with the emergence of human beings. I agree. Gotcha. This one coming in from, do appreciate it, Tig, uh, let me know if I pronounce this right, Tigshva Tridster says, question for Dr. Randall, if humans are valuable because they are made in God's image, can they even have any value without God? Well, so God is a necessary being, right, if God exists at all. So uh, there's no possible world on that construal in which God doesn't exist, but human beings do. But if I'm wrong about theism, I've already responded to this idea that a sort of moral nihilism follows. It doesn't. 
there are atheists like um, Eric Wielenberg, for example, is an atheist and a moral Platonist. So he defends an objective view of morality. Um, people like Thomas Nagel. There's there's many rich frameworks that are non-theistic. Ronald Dworkin, his last book, Great Philosopher, was Religion Without God. So uh, there's different frameworks in which one should could be exploring these issues. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate it. Von Zoom says, is religion simply fabled, let's see, fabled stories to enforce certain behaviors? I think that they're saying, I, mean, I know that the truth of I, I, both of your worldviews isn't really what's debated tonight, but we'll humor it. Dr. Rouser, I think they're asking, you guessed it, uh, basically whether or not real Christianity is true or whether or not it's just to enforce moral behaviors or rules. Or both, I don't know. Well, I'd say both, but but uh, I I know I think Matt mentioned Scientology in passing earlier, and we can probably both agree that Scientology probably exists originally to make people wealthy. You got it. Let me just check if I missed any. This one from GSP. Did I get this? They say, uh, I want to thank Dr. Rouser, one of the best Christian thinkers of today. Humanism is Christianity without any moral obligations or duties. Did I read that before? I don't think so. No. Okay. Thanks. Let me just skim for any last questions that I might have missed from the chat. Otherwise, we can let you guys out of here. I know you're both busy guys. We do want to say, folks, we do appreciate our guests. We appreciate their time with us. It means a lot. And they are, as I mentioned, linked in the description. That includes if you were listening via the podcast. As I said earlier, we do indeed have a podcast for Modern Day Debate. Look it up on your favorite podcast app. And if you're listening via the podcast app, both Matt's and Randall's links are in the description box. That's Matt's YouTube and Randall's book on topics related to this topic for the debate tonight. I want to say huge thank you, Matt and Randall. It's been a true pleasure. Yeah, I hope we get a chance to discuss this or something else uh, another time when we have more time because there's still a lot of questions left, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, Holy. likewise. I really appreciate the time. Thank you both. Uh, one of the challenges today is there's a, a lot of people angry at one another, and we're in our social media silos and we have contempt for one another and we need to really work to undermine that and build the channels of conversation. I think we did that tonight. So thank you very much. If there was no God, what would your objection to humanism be? Don't answer it now. Just think about it for next time. You may not have one. I don't know. Well, if, if, if in fairness, if there was no God, I would be uh, probably a platonic moral objectivist like Eric Wielenberg. If I believe that, yeah. Sweet. And I could be a humanist and be that, for sure. I'd have to study more, but I, I can't dispute that right now. Fair Interesting enough. to say the least. So let me do one last quick plug. Folks, our conference is coming up on Saturday, April 22nd. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be in Fort Worth, Texas. So if you're anywhere near Fort Worth, Texas on Saturday, April 22nd, we're going to have four huge debates, as I mentioned earlier in the debate. If you did not see it, we're excited. It's going to be Hussein Embers and Matt himself debating on whether or not Islam is true. That's just one example of the huge debates that are happening. The links for the in-person tickets are in the description box. Check them out, as well as the link for watching all the debates live at home. If you're too far from Fort Worth, Texas, you can watch it at home for only a buck, as that helps us cover the venue cost. And, my dear friends, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be huge, so we're excited about it. Check out those links right now. And I'll be back in just a moment with some upcoming debates. Amazing! My dear friends, want to say thanks so much for being with us tonight. We hope that you're doing well out there. And I've got to say, I want to say hi to you in the old live chat, as we appreciate you being with us. Wildcard120, thanks for dropping in. I see you there. Natheist, glad to have you with us. Eddie Dean, thanks for coming by as well as Jesus Loves You. I see you there in the chat. Thanks for being with us. We want to say Modern Day Debate, if it's your first time here, is a neutral channel hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. And we hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from, whether you are Christian, atheist, Muslim, you name it. We're glad you're here. And our vision at Modern Day Debate is to provide a level playing field so that everybody can make their case on a neutral debate platform. Our values are these, and we stick to our values in particular. One, we want everybody, as you can probably guess from the neutral, you could say the neutrality idea, we want everybody to have their fair shot. 
In other words, we want things to be fair. Second, our second value is we want people to be able to say what they really believe, no matter how out there or controversial. We want to give everybody that chance. Our speakers were free from their first breath. We want to keep it that way by giving them a chance to say what it is they have on their minds. And that leads to our third value, because a lot of people are like, oh, no, 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 James, hold on a second. I want to control and make sure that some views can't be heard. I want to deplatform certain people. We'd say, hey, we understand that some people have that philosophy. And... I want to say, we believe in the idea that the competition of ideas, and you could say the marketplace of ideas, is actually good for society because those views that some worry are contra too dangerous or you know potentially harmful, the good thing is on a debate platform like Modern Day Debate, those get debunked in front of everybody. So you could say it's almost like getting a vaccine for ideas. In other words, if you see a let's say controversial, like dangerous idea that's put forth, or let's say an anti-scientific anti view, whatever it is, put forth on modern day debate, and then you hear it debunked, it's almost like you're vaccinated against that idea, right? Because when you hear it in the future, you're not caught with your pants down. You're like, no, 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 I've heard of this idea before. I know the counter arguments to it. It's not as simple as what you're trying to make it out to be. In other words, at Modern Day Debate, there is a natural selection of ideas. We think that's a good thing, that if you let the chips fall where they may, if you let a thousand flowers bloom, the best ideas are going to win out. The cream will rise to the top. We believe it, and I can tell you, more importantly, because a lot of critics will say, well, James, you know, that's what you say, but I say this, you know, namely, it's dangerous, and, you know, you're wrong. It, the fact that these controversial views are able to be given a platform on Modern Day Debate, that's bad. And we would say, hey, the tiebreaker is this. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. The empirical evidence actually backs my position. Because I always say, well, hold on, I can give you an empirical argument namely peer-reviewed papers that actually back up my position. And I say, can you? And they're like, oh, uh, well, no, 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 uh, it's just obvious. And I'm like, well, I can say my views are obvious. So you, you see how that works? We can just both claim that our views are obvious or obviously logical or obviously right. But the true tiebreaker then, in the, like in the, you could say, when it really comes down to it, it's going to be who has the empirical evidence. And I've talked about this before. The elaboration likelihood model from Petty and Cassiopo 1986 is a theory not a hypothesis i'm using theory in the scientific sense in that it has mountains of evidence behind it it is called a theory within psychology i'm getting my doctorate in industrial organizational psychology so my specialization isn't in persuasion per se however in my field of psychology persuasion is sometimes actually part of what i've studied for example for my comp exam all those things and i can tell you when it comes to the elaboration likelihood model, the evidence is very clear. Because a lot of our, you could say, contrarians, people who say, like, no, this is bad, modern day debate bad, is they say, it might be that a speaker, because I, I first I say, well, for these people who come on and they have these controversial views or dangerous views, do you think that they have the better arguments? And they go, oh, no, of course not. And I say, okay, good, me neither. And then I say, okay, great. So why are you so nervous about them debating? Because if we get them a competent opponent, like if we handpick somebody where we know you're like, yep, they'll be prepared for this debate. They're not going to show up and not know what they're talking about. Isn't that a good thing that people see these controversial or these dangerous views debunked? And they go, well, uh, you know, maybe, but, but someone might uh, be more persuasive from one of these dangerous, you know, tribes, you might say. If they... <clears throat> one of these tr groups or camps, whatever you want to call it, they might say if they are more attractive or maybe they're more charming, more charismatic, they have, you know, they're funny or whatever it might be, and they might win more people over that one. It's, hey, the elaboration likelihood model covers this. It says that central routes of persuasion that use logic and evidence are more persuasive. And they've done experiments like showing this. So it's, it's not just a theory or an idea. Like, it's a theory in the sense that it has tons of evidence for it, experimental evidence, that's found those central routes of persuasion, namely having the better arguments, are more persuasive than peripheral routes of persuasion, such as being more attractive, having a better sense of humor, that kind of stuff. So, I've got to say, 
the research backs up the idea behind modern day debate. That's why I think it's grown so fast. I want to say thank you guys. I can tell if you're in the live chat. I know that you're a subscriber because I flipped on subscribers only chat mode earlier. So I want to say thank you for your support. Kia Star 67, thanks for your subscriber membership here. Thanks, like. Am I saying it right? Thanks for your kind words. Says, thanks so much, James, for doing Modern Day Debate. I've been a longtime fan and glad to finally catch you moderating live. Thanks so much. That means a ton. It really does. It's encouraging. And Captain Corn Pop, thanks for coming by. I see you there in the live chat. Dewey. Doogie Ranger, thanks for coming by, as well as Canon Carol, Jeremy Nolan, Brandon Johnson, Feed, as well as Pound 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 Smith, thanks for your kind words, we appreciate that Smith, as well as Birdie Numb Nights, Numb Nuts, thanks for coming by, as well as Tim, good to see you again, Buffalo Aquatico, thanks for dropping in, glad that you're with us, as well as CD, and Canon Carol, glad that you're with us, Jungle Jargon, good to see you here, and wildcard 120 want to say thanks for all of your subscribing you guys seriously it really does mean more than you know we appreciate that so i do want to say thank you so much if you haven't hit that like button yet please do hit that like button that helps as well and i've got to say we are excited as that's amazing like thanks to you guys in the most literal way when i say like thank you i've say thank you guys for a lot of things because there are a lot of things that it helps for example when you share debates like we appreciate that too so if you if you haven't you know, if you, let's say you know of a Facebook, let's say a friend online or a group online who likes debates like these, hey, consider hitting that share button right now and sharing the link with them as that helps us at Modern Day Debate big time. Not only that, but I got to say, so that's like a way that you're helping Modern Day Debate in the most real way. And then, you know, if you hit like, it's like, well, it's like, how does that help, James? It's like, well, our videos like get more recommendations, like YouTube recommends them to more people if people hit like more on videos. So we appreciate it. That, that does help for real. But you're kind of like, well, yeah, but that's like kind of like indirect and it only like helps to a degree. But one thing I'm going to say in terms of like, hey, when you're a subscriber, when we hit the 100,000 subscriber mark soon, which is I think it's probably going to be around April 10th because we average about 100 new subscribers a day. And I want to say thank you guys for that. It was completely you. Like you guys have made this channel get to that mark, a mark that I never thought I'd get, uh, get like that I never see modern day debate get to. Thank you guys. Not only that, but potentially we might get that YouTube plaque. I don't know. The silver play button is what I'm talking about. I don't know if we will. I'm a little bit nervous about that. Uh, the only reason I'm a little bit nervous about that is because uh, technically Modern Day Debate has had some controversial debates. And YouTube isn't always comfortable with giving out, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Giving out the plaque, so to speak, when there have been these controversial debates or topics that we've had, but that's okay. I mean, we'll see how they, we'll see how they handle us. I don't know. It'll be pretty interesting to see. I'm intrigued. I'm curious to see whether or not they'll actually give us the plaque, but so that'll be cool. I hope I, I gotta be honest. I'd like it. So if, if we don't, which it's a very real chance we won't because you know, we've had some controversial topics and YouTube, it's one thing to be monetized on YouTube. Uh, they'll monetize like almost anything. It's got to be pretty bad to be demon demonetized. <clears throat> well, maybe not that bad, but, but, but pretty bad. But the idea is this. In order for, for them to give the plaque, like they specifically write, like they specifically put in their terms of, of service, like, hey, if, you're, if you hit that 100,000 mark, we're going to look at your channel pretty thoroughly just to see whether or not we can really give this, you know, the YouTube thumbs up, the stamp of approval, you know, the symbolic stamp of approval of the plaque. So we'll see how that goes. Pretty juicy, pretty controversial. I mean, I'm happy either way. Like, it's exciting. So thank you guys for your support, seriously. Arcade Outpost says, have Warren blog on. I don't know who that is, but it's a possibility. Maybe. I don't know. R Dub says, the guy with the subway tattoo is nervous. That's funny. Maybe a little bit. I Like, I would love. It would be cool to get the plaque, the plate, the the play button, but that's all right. Like I said, more importantly, the biggest thing that we care about, and we're not, so wow. Thank you guys for your hitting like, and thanks for your channel membership. Chuck Pike, thanks so much. Welcome to Extra Juicy. Appreciate that. That really does mean more than you know. 
is I've got to tell you a couple of things. One, there's going to be a debate on in 20 minutes. For real, there's going to be another debate tonight. So this is a kind of a double header. So I do want to encourage you to check that out. <sighs> Not only that, my dear friends, I want to say thank you guys for all of your support. Oh, yeah, that was, that was a surprise. 300. <clears throat> 300 likes. Thank you guys for that. But yeah, it's going to be, I might actually like really celebrate. Like I might go, go out with friends and be like, hey, can I treat you all to like a free subway party? Uh, <laughs> so, because that's like, that's I, I kind of would, would prefer to go out to dinner now that I think about it. But I don't know. It's busy. It's hard to like get out for a sit down kind of restaurant, you know, or uh, at least uh, what a, a, a like sit and wait for your, you know, to be, to get a table type of restaurant. I don't go to those a lot. It just it takes so much time. It takes a lot of time. But anyway, the thing is, we're excited. Yeah, that's going to be big. I have to be honest. Like, that's something that's pretty special to me. I'm excited about that. So thank you guys for your support. Now, there is that debate coming up tonight on whether or not NASA is trustworthy. So it is going to be juicy. It's going to be controversial. You don't want to miss it. Arcade Outpost says, I've been pestering this channel since it started. That's true, Arcade. I remember you for a long time, for real. You're one of our, I think, like, when we first got monetized, Ronald Mendonca and you were some of the first people that sent our, our first ever super chats. I think it was like you, um, what was there was a name called something tracks. What was it? I can't remember the, but you Ronald Mendonca and I can't remember the name of the other person were like our first ever people that gave a super chat, which is cool. That's crazy. Cause I remember and that was like 2020 was 2019. It was 2019 when we got monetized. So that's crazy. So it is crazy that we've been doing this for so long, but it's exciting and it's fun. And, you know, for me, I'm just like, wow. But Tinfoil Hats says, yo, thanks for coming by, Tinfoil Hats. And Buffalo Aquatico says, oh, I subscribed last time. I guess it only showed now. Wow. And Tsunami says, I thought you were going to say Ronald McDonald. Him too. He's been a huge supporter. K-L-W-E-I-N says, James, you look marvelous. Thanks for your kind words. We appreciate that. That's encouraging. I always love doing these post credit shows. And I've got extra energy tonight because we finished a little bit earlier than usual. So for me, I'm like, don't worry, Amy. I promise I'm not going to be going. I, I'm going to maybe, I might even go like up until like maybe another 10 minutes. And then I might say, hey, folks, like, this stream, it's going to be, I'm going to put the link in the, in the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Let me put it in there right now. I'm going to actually put it in there like right now for you guys, the link for the next debate tonight. And then you can have more than one tab open for real, because you don't want to miss this one tonight. It's a juicy, fun one, whether or not you can trust NASA, whether or not NASA is deceitful, but I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, you know what? Let me show you this. Have you guys seen this? I know a lot of you guys have seen this through the post credits, the normal po normal post credit scene, but I want to show you guys this stuff. It's pretty cool. So in particular, you might be like, James, what are you going to show me? Well, look on screen right now. Debate Con 3.1. This is our third conference. We're really excited about this, you guys. We've been working on this, like mastering the whole conference thing. We've been working really hard. And it's getting better every single time. So I'm really excited about that. Is that Saturday... April 22nd. In other words, in exactly three weeks, it's coming fast. In exactly three weeks from right now, this Saturday, we're going to be in Fort Worth, Texas. You don't want to miss this one. You have to watch it live. It's going to be epic. You have two ways of watching it live. One, and this is the first way, the kind of like more standard way I would recommend is I would say, hey, folks, well, let me first show you the debate. So, and then we'll talk about how you can watch it live. Because you might be wondering, like, what, what is DebateCon, James? Like, are you, it's just as simple as this. We have four debates in one day. So, for example, you can see on screen right now, these are those debates. So, right above me, you can see David Wood and Kenny Bomer. See? They're going to be debating a topic that, very controversial. I'm like, ooh, this is, uh, whether or not. Aisha's marriage with Muhammad was uh, morally, uh, whether or not it was acceptable ethically. It's going to be controversial. 
That debate is going to be huge, and you don't want to miss it. Seriously, we're excited about that. Then you can see next over is Atheist versus Atheist. Aaron Raw and T Jump will be debating whether or not religion does more good than harm. That's going to be another juicy debate. Then, as you can see, Atheist versus Muslim Matt Dillahunty will be debating Hussein Embers on whether or not Islam is true. And then Mike Jones versus Daniel Hakikachu. You guys, I'm pumped about this. Whether or not it's going to be on is child marriage acceptable? Yeah, controversial to say the least, my friends. I mean, I know it is. Very controversial. So now you know what DebateCon is. It's those four debates in a single day. So we start at 9.30, and then about every three hours or so, we do a new debate. So Because each debate takes about two hours, and then we have breaks for things like lunch, stuff like that. So let me show you this, though, because you might be like, okay, I get the idea of what DebateCon is. How can I go there? How can I watch it live, James? Well, I'll tell you. As you can see on screen right now, DebateCon 3.1, this is the, the web page for Eventbrite. Eventbrite is just a third-party website that we use in order for people to buy in-person tickets. So that's linked in the description right now. And in fact, I'm going to put it in the old live chat right now as well. Whew. So right now, get your in-person tickets to DebateCon. This is going to be a monstrous debate conference. Modern Day Debates, it's our own. So this channel, like that's ours. That's, that's our conference. We don't share it with anybody, so like we don't split it. It's just like, hey, we'll run this whole thing ourselves because we're pumped about debates. Not only that, but you might be wondering like, well, okay, James, but what if I'm too far? Because I know a lot of you are not near Fort Worth, Texas. In fact, you know, like I said, I think I told you guys last night if you were listening, our most popular city, like the city that we get the most views in, out of all cities, and this totally surprised me, in the last 28 days, it was not New York City, which you'd think it would be because the U.S. is the most popular country for us, for our listeners. Although I've got to say, we, we do have a lot of viewers in Canada, Australia, England, Ireland, a decent amount, English-speaking countries mostly, of course. But the biggest city that we're actually viewed in more than any other city, it's not Los Angeles either. It's not Chicago. It's it's London. Isn't that crazy? I didn't know that. So that's cool. So we have a ton of viewers scattered all over the world, which is super encouraging. We appreciate everybody's support from wherever you are, from all over the place. You guys can watch the debate from home, live. So you have plans for Saturday, April 22nd. You do have plans already. You can watch it for just a buck. All of it live. So that's 25 cents per debate. So a quarter per debate. Like imagine if you're like, oh, I was like put a 25 cents down and watch this here debate. Super affordable. The reason is many hands make light work because for us, the venue is pretty pricey. You know, venues are costly to rent out a, a place and then host a debate there. That does, uh, it is something that is costly for us. And so we want to let you know, if you put into this crowdfund through Indiegogo, which is linked in the description, and I'm going to put that link right now in the live chat as well. If you put in a buck, you can watch the whole thing live. Indiegogo is super convenient. This is just a third party website. It's just a crowdfund. It's like Kickstarter or almost like GoFundMe, except there are tiers. Like there are like rewards basically where we send some people back depending on what donation amount they give. Now, you might be wondering, like, ah, James, but I don't know. Is it, like, hard to do this Indiegogo stuff? Like, I'm, you know, I don't want to create an account. Like, that's kind of a pain. It's actually super easy. So let me show you. As you can see on screen right now, this is Indiegogo. If you click on that link, you don't even have to create an account. You can just sign in through Facebook. Just, whew, it's like a breeze. You just, boom, you're in. So that's one big thing. I've got to tell you, you guys, it is so easy. My dear friends, I want you to know, it's really cool. It's so easy. Just boom, you can sign up with Facebook. Or if you want to create an account, because, hey, we're going to be doing more of these conferences in the future. Piece of cake, Indiegogo, super trusted. And you might be wondering, well, James, like, but, uh, you know, what about if I put in and, you know, like, what if you guys have more funds than the venue requires? If we have more funds than the venue requires, 
all of the funds are being reinvested back into modern day debate for the next conference for real. So for us, we are absolutely determined to reinvest any extra funds that come in through ticket sales or through the crowd fund back into modern day debate conferences. Like that's guaranteed. So for example, like we were a little in the green on the last one. So maybe like a few hundred bucks and I've put in more than a few hundred bucks for this conference personally. In other words, like funds that I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be reimbursed for. So like flyer miles, I put in about, uh, I think it's about a thousand bucks, but that for me, like, <clears throat> I'm glad that like the last conference helps a little bit with that. But for me, like, I'm happy to put my own like resources into it. Cause for me, I'm like determined, like I, I love modern day debate. Like I bleed modern day debate, blue and black come out of my veins. If you cut my, if you cut through my veins, it would just be blue and black, the modern day debate colors. But I want to show you this cause you might be new to Indiegogo. You're like, James, I don't still don't understand how this works. You said there's like these tiers. Well, let me show you on the screen right now. On the very top of the screen, you can see there, watch the whole conference live, just a buck. Super cheap, super cool. The way that works, and by the way, if you're already a Patreon supporter or a channel member, you're already in. Like we've got you covered. You don't even have to, have to put into the, the crowdfund. Like no problem. Next up though, is let's say you're like, well, hey, I, like I'm willing to put in a, an extra buck. Like I, I love modern day debate and you know, I'm, I'm happy to support it. So, you know, I, I watch you guys all the time and I love it. I'm going to put in three bucks. You can do that. In which case we put, oh, that's right. Let me see if this works. I've got to get out of here quick because Amy's setting up for the next debate. So I'm going to put the link really quick for the next debate, but I will in the live chat. And then I'm also going to just quick wrap up in terms of like all the based uh, little cool things that come along with this modern day debate, debate con tier list for Indiegogo. Two seconds, let me put this in. So, I just put that link for this next debate that's starting in eight minutes. But I'm gonna quick finish up on the tiers here. So watch the conference live. Next one is you can give a couple of extra bucks. The next tier is if you wanna support without a perk, you're like, well, I can't actually watch it that day. Uh, and I don't really care if I get the link, but I wanna like throw in a little bit of support. And I'm like, ah, I'm just doing it just out of a pure donation. $5 is the next one. Embroidered, or I should say it's an embossed postcard. We will send you a postcard. If you donate at the $10 amount, it'll be an embossed postcard with the debate con or modern day debate emblem embossed on the postcard with my personal thank you. Next up is your name in the credits. At the end, we will have a list of all the people that have donated to help make this conference possible where we'll say, hey, thank you so much, so-and-so, 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 so-and-so at the end of the debates. Next up is signed emblem from all debaters. And you might be like, what does that look like, James? I don't know what that looks like. Well, here, I'll give you an example of what this would look like. On screen, you can see it says debate con. That's what I mean by emblem, like the debate con logo. And then the, you can see the modern day debate logo on the left is it'll have all the speakers, for example, like Matt Dillahunty, RN Raw, all of their signatures on it. And not only that, because you might be like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. But what else is there? The next level up is 60 bucks. If you donate that much, you can have one of your questions read during the actual conference. So in other words, you can email me and say, hey, James, like I'm watching this debate right now because I'll be checking my email as the debates are going for this perk. Then you can say, hey, like I've got a question. So, you know, here it is. It's so it's for so-and-so. It's the Muslim guy that Matt is debating. And, you know, here's my question. So that's an option too. And yours, it'll be read just like as if you were in person. So that's kind of cool. You can be a part of the experience that way as well as next up, if you donate at the $75 tier mark, a signed photo of your favorite debater. So you let us know who your favorite debater is. We take a picture of them from the actual conference. So this isn't just like a picture from like Google. Like it's a, where we take the picture at the conference of them. We print it off because we've got an instant photo printer that we just got. Matt, like Chris Gammon's learning how to, how to do it, which I'm super, super grateful. Uh, so thank you, Chris. We then ask the speaker to sign it and then we mail it to you as a gift of thanks. And not only that, remember every tier, we're actually giving you that gift plus all of the gifts 
from the tiers underneath it. So for example, in that case, if you did do the $75 signed photo of your favorite debater, you'd also get one question during the Q&A, a signed emblem from DebateCon mailed to you as well, your name in the credits, plus an embossed postcard sent to you as well. So a lot of, and then of course you get to watch it live, the entire thing live as well. So all of those perks, and then Zoom chat one-on-one -on -one with James, if you put in $100, it can be anything you want. If you're like, James, tell me all the secrets about how you do modern day debate. I want to know about the software. I want to know about your methods in terms of setting up debates. I'll tell you the truth. Like, I'll give you those, like, give you the, the juicy stuff. So if you want to do your, like, like, your own channel of modern day debate, your own version of it or something like that, that's something that I'd be willing to do. Or maybe it's like, James, I want to know, like, what are you, what do you think are the most important tactics while debating, whatever it might be. Or maybe you're just like, James, I just want to make you listen to me read the dictionary for an hour over Zoom. And uh, that's what I'm going to do to you. Okay. That's really what you want. Like, okay. So <laughs> I want to say thank you guys for your support. We're excited about this conference. Seriously, it is going to be epic. You don't want to miss it. I've got to go. So do click on that link for the next debate that is starting up at five minutes. And I'm going to sign out from Zoom so Amy can set up for that debate that's starting in five minutes. You have to check in. Whew. Do check in. So... That debate, you don't want to miss it. Thanks, guys, for your support. I love you guys. Appreciate everything, and I will see you at the next one. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable.